Hi friends, today we will again talk about chargers. And since many are bored with all sorts of pulsed power supply circuits, which are many on my channel, I will show you a circuit of a fairly universal, simple and mega reliable charger, which was popular among our grandparents. The circuit is now in front of you. There are an iron transformer, a pair of powerful thyristors and an adjustment unit. By the way, here isn't used linear adjustment method, but phase pulse adjustment. Due to that, the efficiency of the circuit is quite high. Thyristors are a regulator and at the same time a rectifier, so there is no additional diode rectifier. This is a big plus. Circuits of this class are almost rubber. You take a more powerful transformer, thyristors and get a ready charging starting device. Well, now let's study how it works. Linear and PWM method of power control is well known to you, but in this case of thyristors, not everything is so simple. A completely different principle is needed here. In the case of a linear adjustment method that isn't applicable to thyristors, the power is regulated by the regulating element, usually a transistor. Depending on the value of the input signal, the resistance of the open transition varies linearly from 1 to 100%. The more open the transistor, the less the resistance of its transition and therefore it passes the more current and more power at the output. In the case of PWM adjustment method, the transistor is either fully open when a high level signal is applied or completely closed if a low level is applied. At that, the power is controlled by the time the transistor is in one of the two states. The longer the transistor is open, the greater the power and vice versa. This method is the most economical because the transistor operates in the switch mode. At the open state, the resistance of its transition or channel is minimal. Therefore, there is almost no heating, hence a very high efficiency. In the case of thyristors, things aren't so simple. These two methods can't be applied to it. A thyristor can easily be opened by sending a signal to the control electrode, but it is almost impossible to forcibly close it. It closes only when the voltage is removed from the power terminals. In the AC circuit, this happens automatically when the voltage passes through the zero point. The most popular method of thyristor control is the phase pulse control principle using the so-called relaxation generators. In fact, the generator can be in two states. At its output, there is either a control pulse or it isn't. The amplitude and the duration of this pulse don't change. It is possible to change the number of pulses per unit of time or frequency. In our circuit, the relaxation generator is built on the basis of two transistors and, in fact, it's analogous to a signal junction transistor or dynister. The response time is given by the values of the specified transistors and capacitors. This works in a simple way. From the power winding of the transformer or from an additional low power one, the alternating voltage through the low power diode bridge is rectified to a constant one and fed to the generator circuit. The power circuit has a zener diode to stabilize the power supply voltage of the generator. Through a chain of resistors, the capacitor is charged and as soon as the voltage on it reaches a certain value, the generator will operate. At its output is formed a voltage which will open the thyristor. The capacitor it discharges, the pulse is disappeared and then the process repeats again. With a variable resistor, we reduce or increase the charge of time of the capacitor and hence the number of control pulses per unit of time or simply to say, change the frequency of the pulses. Thyristors are controlled through an isolation transformer. In fact, there are many ways to control, through diodes or transistors. But in my case, it was used the transformer since in the future, I'm going to experiment with the adjustment of thyristors from mains and the transformer will provide a galvanic isolation. You can use other methods of control. The transformer has two secondary windings that control the thyristor. In the presence of a control pulse thyristor is triggered. It closes only when current passes through the zero point. Thyristor can be opened at any point of the half wave. If it is opened at the beginning of the half wave, then naturally more current will pass through it. If in the middle of the half wave, the current is less, if at the end even less. In fact, 
the thigh resistor will cut the sine wave, passing only part of it to the output. The smaller the piece of sinusoid, the lower the output power. This is a very simple explanation. I hope the principle is clear. Well, now go to the components. There will be no problems with the generator. The values of the components aren't critical. You can deviate in both directions by 30%. The generator is assembled on a compact printed circuit board. It can be downloaded together with the archive of the project via the link under the video. And high quality industrial boards can be ordered on the GLC website at the lowest prices. Production time is only 24 hours from the time of the order is received. The color, size, complexity of the boards isn't a problem because high precision machine tools are used in the production and everything will be done at the best level. Just upload Gerber file of the board to the GLC website, select the options you need, and that's all. A link to the company's website and to the video with the full process of production of the boards can be found in the description under the video. My transformer is wound on a yellow-white ring from the group stabilization filter of a computer power supply. The size of the transformer is now in front of you. At the beginning, I reeled up the secondary windings, 2 by 90 turns, with a wire of 0.31 mm. We must try to wind without overlaps, evenly stretching the turns around the ring. Above this, I reeled up another 90 turns. This is primary winding. I filled the control or secondary windings with epoxy and only then wound the primary one. This is done for safety since, as I said earlier, my transformer is experimental and later will control thyristors which will work directly from main part. I must admit that during the pursuit of a large output current, the control windings of this transformer had burned together with less powerful thyristors for 10 amperes. Therefore, the winding of the transformer had been reeled up again. The core of the same material, but the dimensions are slightly smaller. You asked about pouring transformers. For this purpose, I use Chinese epoxy resin in syringes. It dries completely in about 20 minutes. During this time, you must turn the transformer in different directions in your hands in order to evenly distribute the resin throughout the core. The main thing isn't to overdo it. The resin amount shouldn't be too much. Otherwise, it turns out not quite beautiful. You can use a resin of any color. Transformers filled in this way are extremely reliable and very beautiful. The primary winding has additionally varnished, but this wasn't necessary. I must point your attention that control windings are fully equivalent and wound at the same time. They must provide sufficient voltage and current to unlock the thyristors. The voltage can be checked with an oscilloscope. It is important not to confuse the beginning of the windings. In the diagram, they are indicated by dots. As for the characteristics of my device version, it can provide charging current up to 12 to 13 amperes, but you can get 200 if you choose appropriate power components, the thyristor and the transformer. Let's go to the components. Recently, once again, I visited the local flea market and got these green monsters. These are quite powerful thyristors produced many years ago. Thyristors are for 25 amperes, but look at the cross-section of the power wire. I think that the limit is much more than 25 amperes. We need two thyristors. In my version, the transformer is like this. Power about 200 watts, but it's capable of more. There are four secondary windings by 6.3 volts each, with a current of about 8 amperes, although the current of one of the windings is slightly smaller than the rest. Due to the speciality of such a rectifier, a transformer is needed with two identical windings, which are connected to the middle point. The final output voltage or charge voltage will not exceed the voltage of one of the shoulders minus thyristor losses. So, if you make charger for a car battery, it is desirable that the windings are for 20 volts. For this transformer, the only logical connection of the windings taking into account the situation is shown in the figure. All windings connected in serial with a tap from the midpoint, but the fact is that the final output voltage will be about 12.6 volts. This is not enough to charge the batteries. The transformer is designed to work in 220 volts main, but in fact we have 230 to 240 volts 
in the outlet for a long time. That is, the output voltage will be more, about 28 volts in total or about 14 volts in the shoulder. Less than necessary, but it will do for measurements. Thyristors are installed on a common radiator since their anodes are connected according to circuit. Don't forget to isolate all connections in order to avoid short circuit. So sometimes it happens and all the work goes to trash. Therefore this time, for reliability, I isolate it all with the reg insulation tape. At the end I found an arrow device from an ancient multimeter and decided to use it as an ammeter. The shunts were also available and I was incredibly lucky here. I didn't have to calculate and tune anything. With a shunt of 50 amperes, 75 millivolt, the lowest scale very accurately shows a current of up to 30 amperes. On the laboratory power supply, a current of 5 amperes is set. The ammeter shows the same value, so I was lucky. To fit into the retro atmosphere, I brought this beloved old multimeter. It will show the voltage at the output of the charger. The whole scale is 15 volts. I almost forgot, all measurements are done under the load, otherwise the multimeter will go crazy. So now let's go from words to deeds. The first launch of the circuit, as always, is done through a safety lamp. If everything works as it should, don't forget to install the fuses in the input and output circuit. Everything is ready, as the load we have a monstrous incandescent lamp of the corresponding period. As you can see, the current seems to be regulated and regulated quite smoothly. We can get 12 to 13 amperes from such a transformer. It is possible more, but there will be drawdown and overheating. For thyristors, such currents aren't problematic, they almost don't heat up. The circuit suffers short circuit at low and medium currents without problems. The power will be limited. At extreme currents, the transformer will be in hard condition, so the fuses must be installed. The minimum output current of about 4 amperes. Now let's check the stability of the output voltage depending on the change in the mains. The output of the charger is loaded with low power lamps. The digital multimeter shows the mains voltage and the arrow device shows the output from the charger. Changes in the mains voltage lead to changes in the output and in practice you need to control the charge current. This is perhaps the main drawback of such chargers, but in general it works very well. About the shortcomings, modern battery chargers charge the battery with stable current and voltage. But in those days, no one bothered with this. You need to understand that this is a charger that will not control the voltage on the battery and turn off the power when fully charged. Here, the user decides with which value of current and for how long to charge the battery. Because of this drawback, I advise you to add a unit for automatically turn off the battery when fully charged. I showed the circuit of such unit in one of the past videos. The link is in the description. You also need to remember that there is no protection except for fuses. Among the advantages is super reliability. To burn such a charger, you need to really try hard. The circuit isn't capricious, the adjustment is quite smooth, high repeatability, very simple design and low cost because almost all components can be found in old stocks. It has a rather high efficiency due to the almost pulse principle of adjustment. The important moment is that there is no need to use an additional rectifier. The thyristors themselves are both a regulator and a rectifier. Together with a reliable iron transformer, such a device will serve for decades and most importantly it is universal and can be used to charge a variety of batteries. Again I repeat that the charging process needs to be monitored. And here is another point that I honestly haven't decided to attribute to advantages or disadvantages. The battery will be charged with a pulsating current. Many say that it isn't even useful for battery. I personally can't say anything about this. Here is the form of current that will charge the battery. Well, that's all. The full archive of the project with a printed circuit board can be downloaded from the link in the description. Please don't forget to rate this video and subscribe to my Instagram. If you have any questions, you are welcome to our group. All the links are in the description. Now I have to say goodbye. Until we meet again, with you was Kassian TV.